Well, I've been listening to all your stuff and it's super, super warm. I mean, you really have such an eclectic sound at work. It's jazz, <laughs> R&B. Um, it's, it's so mature. It's such a, cause how old are you? 22. 22. Gosh. So you're, but it's, it's such a, the production is great on the new album. Your, your first album, I mean, it's so advanced. Yeah. That's really the word for it. I think it's. No, I really appreciate Many compliments. that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. When, you know, speaking of that music, you know, the, the exciting thing right now, like, as I mentioned, is we're working on a bunch of new music. Um, okay. And so, you know, it's in that same vein of taking that kind of eclectic approach and especially like in songwriting, which I love because I think, you know, like the way I grew up with music was. I was listening to all different kinds. You know, I was listening from stuff from like Stevie Wonder, Motown to, you know, Beatles, Rolling Stones, you know, British Invasion to like Eagles to then like, you know, any sort of modern type of music now. And so being eclectic is honestly like the most honest to my identity. Like we don't like making one form of music feels like that would almost be limiting in some capacity. So. The fact that we're able to have the, you know, the, with the band and you know, the people we work with to, you know, have that vision come to life is so exciting and such a privilege, really. Yeah, it's very unusual because these days we seem to be pushed into the center though, because people don't want you to have a multiple emotions. You're either the sad artist. So that when people go into the, when they're working in the coffee shop, they can put you on and they, it's your hundred percent. They know what you're going to be playing, you know? Right. When they get, you know, the, yours or you're the study music band or your dad's yeah. band you know, Saturday night, and it's, you, you don't have to think so much because you just put on that artist because that's that emotion. So it's very restrictive, no? The commodification of the artist. I'm working on a dissertation. I guess I should start it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that would, that'd, be, that'd be pretty good, huh? That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> because you're, you're an educated man. I mean, well. I tried my very best and we'll see what my professor says. She'll probably have some funny stories, but yeah, no, I, I, I got my degree in May. So I, I mean, that's one thing I definitely miss honestly is, is the classroom. Cause especially my last, well, really year and a half of school was, I never stepped foot in a classroom again. You know, mm. I, like this, this professor who, who was going to be joining us, you know, I've actually never met her in person. And she is your professor. Well, she was my, she was, yeah. She, so she was my professor in a class, um, called seminar in migration, which just studied, you know, like legal processes around migration in terms of like legislation, in terms of history, in terms of the different drivers and motivators of, of forced migration, you know, like cultural differences, you know, looking at borders as a transaction. So super interesting. And I thought, you know, with my climate change background, you know, an issue that we're already seeing, especially coming out in Southeast Asia and, and, you know, like Afghanistan, Middle East and Iraq is, you know, this idea of forced migration because of, of climate change, which I think in the industry, in the, in the field, I said industry, there's the music in me, but the, in the field, they're calling climate displacement. So yeah, I think it's an emerging issue. I think it's always kind of been an issue. But I think in terms of public eye, it's definitely an emerging issue that is only going to accelerate. So I think it's important, which is why I'm so excited that we had this podcast, because I think to accelerate the process of trying to fix this problem, the best way to do that is to get, at least the first step is to like have people, is to, is to educate people about this very issue. And that's why this podcast is such a great idea you know, not just with climate change, but with any sort of social issue, because, you know, in terms of a social movement, a huge driver for having that change is educating people about the issue. You know, it's kind of a one-on-one, I could just almost, you know, don't even need to be said, but I think it just feels like it's important work. And so that's why, you know, the fact that we're able to fuse together that side of my identity with like Wait, we're musicians at heart, right? So like, let's, you know, let's, I mean, it's, it's really, really, I've told so many people about it. I got, I've tried to turn some people onto the podcast series because seriously, I think it's something that honestly, I personally want to 
figure out a way that I can interact with both, you know, music and you know, social issues. And as I said, kind of with like making eclectic music, like doing that would be the most fulfilling image of myself. So I applaud that you do it and that you do it successfully. It's really inspiring, Jack. Seriously, man, it's great. You could, well, no, but you could be the next Frank Zappa. And it's, it's, <laughs> if you, cause if you can get lyrics with your style of music, if you can get those, the thinking man's lyrics then you're made. Yeah. <sighs> lyrics make you live forever. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I read that, but it resonated. Yeah. I'll dump using that. <laughs> That's great. Um. So is she just, is, is, is she late? Was she supposed to come on at 10.30? No, no, she comes on. It's, uh, I have 20 minutes with you. So the audience gets to know you. Oh, and really? Then we transition. Otherwise it's just too much. If, you know, because different hosts every week. I mean, I'm some, yeah, right. I'm some modicum of consistency and that's not yeah, a fragment right. consistency, but. Um, okay. But just going back to what you said about, yeah, getting these issues. It's this is actually going to be about my fourth episode on borders. I, I just had a look before you before I talk to you and it is, yeah, it's incredible. I've actually been, because I had a friend who, who went to Greece in the refugee camps and I interviewed him on one of my first episodes. And then he, he met these girls who were, had a refugee library and he, he tried to get help a lot of these, these Syrian refugees coming over the border. Hmm. And it was such, it was a huge insight for him because when you look at the media, refugees are, are all are supposed to be the poorest, most uneducated people. That's kind of a prejudice that just pumped through the media, I think. And, and when he got there and, and, and met them in person, he realized that it's actually the richest people from Syria who could afford to, to be refugees who could come over, you know, so there's professors and pharmacists and lawyers and, and, and they're just the nicest people as well. It's just. He was just blown over by the whole experience, just being there in person. Yeah. That, and that's something that's really interesting though. I also would, was learning about in this, in this class I took with the professor was, you know, understanding that like these assimilation processes where, you know, people who have higher education degrees are forced, you know, through language barriers, through legal barriers, through religious barriers, um, cultural barriers, you know, but that you could have a a neurosurgeon from Egypt who comes to the United States, but because of these different, these barriers to entry, you know, they're working like a blue collar job and, and you know, and then how that effect impacts the generations of immigrants. And then, so like that Egyptian doctor's children and their children, and it's, it's really, you know, I, I mean, and when it comes down to it, that's like the history of mankind is movement, you know? And I think like, it's so, it feels so backwards to me that there are so many logistical, you know, just challenges to having people with value enter a country and contribute, you know, because the narrative, especially in the United States is, you know, it's like, oh, like these, these foreign Immigrants are bringing COVID, they're bringing violence, you know, but like it's in the United States where you have the majority of white evangelical Christians or, you know, low income people that are living in rural areas and, you know, like in the majority, right? Where it's like, they're the super spreaders of COVID because they're willingly not getting the vaccine, you know? And so it's, it's, it's so interesting, you know, trying to piece together the truth versus, you know, like how the media portrays, like you mentioned different immigration processes and, and people that come. Actually, I was reading that the most unvaccinated population in America are the Hispanic because they just because they, they've, they're very suspicious of it. And also there's many, there were many issues about that. So, mm. yeah, that's interesting. I didn't know that. I wonder if his, his, like Hispanic Americans or immigrants that are, I think both. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, I think it is it actually in racially it is the these I don't want to say I'm very careful well I'm very un, very careful with the words I use now because it's a minefield so yeah maybe I, let's move on no I I, 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 I feel <laughs> yeah. you don't worry it, this could be quoted and but my brother lives in Texas and mm. in Mexicans run the place if they if they left there will be nobody to do the work you know he has a business and he uses 
he's completely reliant on the make foreign work. work. Yeah. 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 Wow. So I think so much of American particularly work is done by, by immigrants. You, it, we just had Brexit in England, which is another example of, you know, you don't realize how many topics borders touch on so many topics. I mean, because mm -hmm. Brexit with England, they voted to leave the EU. This, right, this, right. this wonderful free market where people could, and when I graduated university, I could go and work in Holland mm -hmm. as a, as a young man into another country and without any issues. Uh, and that's gone now from, from the new generation. Yeah. Thanks Boris. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I, his, his classmate, David actually, but uh, we weren't. Oh, really? No, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Um. Also, yeah. Well, and also Boris is, you're right. Boris's bus was just a big thing. Yeah. PNHS in any way. So, so just this idea of, of this whole idea of borders is, is, is it, it's kind of an imaginary thing, but it's enforced upon us and it's. And it feels like it's an, it's in, ter in terms of an imaginary thing, you know, like it's, it's, it's constructed, you know, like mm. why, why do we feel like we need to, and granted, you know, there are certain precautions and limitations that do make sense you know, in terms of census counting and then yeah. therefore, you know, funding and taxes and, and you know, that, that, that it is important, but it just seems like there's been recently, you know, in the last, I do want to say since nine 11, you know, like this, this recent rise in nationalism and it's like nativist mentality where it's, there's this apprehension towards, towards immigrant, towards immigration as a process, so, you know, like the house I'm in right now, the, the drummer in my band, his parents are. They, and they emigrated to the United States from Venezuela and they've been incredibly successful and have raised a family and have a strong community. And like, it, it's like, those are the stories that you don't hear as much. Like mm. you hear more about the stories where there's violence or there's failure or there's corruption, but, and again, maybe that's large in part due to the media. You know, I think there's so much success that happens with immigration. And that's why, you know, as we talk about, you know, this forced displacement as a result of climate change, you know, you're getting people where that they had, they had full-time careers, a complete community, you know, higher education degrees, you know, um, they're financially, you know, secure. And yet the reason why they have to move is because if they stay, they could they could lose their home. They, I mean, there's, there's no fresh drinking water. There is risk of wildfire. There's risk of, so it's, there, there's a, there's a level of apathy. I feel that has emerged with people like who for some reason fail to understand that it's so much more complex than, well, I don't want people coming here that aren't, you know, that aren't from here or like, is there, is this illegal or, you know, like there's, it's kind of almost taboo at this point where I feel like we need to be working opposite and moving in the opposite direction because this own sort of migratory environment is going to be happening not only internationally, but within borders, you know, like with just taking within the United States, for example, I mean, the Southwest United States is on average in July, a hundred last year was the average temperature was 115 degrees. And there are millions of people that live there with pre-existing health conditions, the elderly, young children. I mean, and there's already not enough drinking water to, I mean, like California, like Los Angeles County's water supply is operating at one third capacity. I mean, it's, it's just like, there's going to be a lot of movement. And I think people need to understand that there needs to be a, a more open reception to that idea rather than this nativist and kind of I, I, this like lack of trust mm -hmm. in people. And maybe COVID has something to do with it. Like in terms of trusting people, you know, this idea of like, you're either, a, you are pro or anti-mask and that kind of delineates who you are as a person and your political views and all these different things. But it, as we can see, it's a complicated issue. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine if all America has, all the different states had solid borders that you had to have a, an identity card to cross from Maine to New York or wherever you, wherever you right. are. Right. Right. Like that would be. What? What? What a crazy construct. Yeah. And, and like in terms of the people who normally would have, would promote something along those lines would probably have their biggest value in the economy. And that very thing would completely, as it's already probably happening in Brexit, it would just has so much hindrance on the economy. Yeah. Yeah. 
with trade, with business, with, yeah, it's just constructs. Yeah. 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 So, Ugh. well, here we are on a Thursday morning, trying to figure it all out. <laughs> it's up to us. We have to do yeah. it. We could put the world to rights. One of my other guests that the way he spoke to was a, an economist, Brian Kaplan, and he wrote a book called Keyholes, Open Borders, it was called. So I wrote a song, Keyhole Solutions to Open Borders, because he had these sort of economic, well, he, he had an interesting story because he wrote this book in a cartoon form. So he hired, instead of being a boring, boring economist, he, he hired a, his favorite cartoonist to make a picture book, you know? Mm -hmm. And his, his thing is these keyhole solutions, like in economics, what's the smallest tax or legislative or administrative change we can do to fix a solution. Mm. So actually I can't remember off the top of my head, any examples that just slipped my mind, but it, it all, oh, one of them was, so instead of green cards, you have blue cards. It's just an idea. So because the, the, the headline objective is immigrants come in and they take all our welfare. So right. make them make the welfare is not available to them. Which sounds in initially to liberal mindset, that's quite, that's really unfair, but it's less unfair than them living in another country where they're suffering all those things that you said before, and then that they get credits and points towards an eventual green pass. And just to, just to use these key or solutions to remove one by one, the objections to open borders. Yeah, and it, I mean, that makes sense too. You know, as a liberal minded 22 year old, like, I don't think people who are not citizens of a country should be getting welfare from that country, that which it could be taken away from welfare of citizens of that country. You know, I mean, I think that's, that's pretty on, on brand with, you know, sound economics, but those type of keyhole solutions, I think that's really interesting. I think that could totally be applied to what we're talking about today, you know, with the idea of how to target this issue of you know, climate displacement and wh wh where do you begin in terms of those issues? You know, in terms of those questions, actually, you know, what I could do right now is I could put those questions that I sent you an email, maybe in the chat. Just so, and I don't know if they'll, she'll see it when. No, you just ask them as they come up, you, uh, you go with the flow of it. Yeah, she's so great though, Heba. Oh my God. She's, it's funny. She's one of my favorite professors I ever had at my time at undergrad. And that's saying a lot considering, again, I've never actually met her in person, <laughs> but you know, she's so articulate and her ability to convey ideas from, because she has a PhD and you know, she from Columbia and she's teach, she teaches part-time at Princeton and Boston University. So she is, you know, very cerebral where's she but, from originally so this is also kind of exciting because it it not only is a, something that she teaches by topic but something that she has lived through so she's a second immigrant second immigration second generation immigrant from egypt her her, her parents were born in egypt and i think she was i don't know if she was born in egypt well i'll, I'll ask this to her um you know when she comes on but but she's born and she was raised in Queens, New York. And I think she's first generation higher education in the United States. So she's definitely paved a way for herself. And, you know, she's incredibly ambitious and a genius and relatable. And, you know, again, like she can take these big abstract issues and synthesize them into examples, synthesize them into ways for, for layman's terms, for, for me, the student who mm. has very little knowledge in the issue, in the topic, you know, coming into that class to completely understand and grasp. So yeah, she's, she's crushing it. She's a great, she's a great professor. I, <laughs> I definitely hope that she sticks with it. It's great what you're doing as well, though, because now we have to condense this down into a three minute song. <laughs> Take it to an even finer level of distillation. Yes, yes, you're right. Wow, yeah, totally true. Yeah, yeah. So, so when you conduct these interviews, do you are you are you taking notes? Because I was thinking about taking notes, not in terms of like in, in an academic mindset, because that's what I'm used to taking notes doing. But 
in terms of like key words I'll hear or like phrases that almost have like, like a rhythm to it. You know, like lyrics make you live forever. Like that kind of like, well, that, that's, that's a moment. Like I want to, I want to, like that's either something we can use out of context that can then inspire something or that very line could be, you know, a, a line in and of itself. Like how, how do you go about these interviews? Are you actively taking notes? Yeah, I take notes, but it's most important is to write the song straight after the interview. Like if you go now out for, you know, for a coffee and talk about something else, then you you lose the energy. It's very important, like straight afterwards to, to just pick up an instrument and, or, and just get something down then because then it's within you, you know, to get up to this level again of energy after mm -hmm. you're gonna have to have six coffees and listen to the whole thing again. So yeah. it's much easier to do it now. Yeah. Well, yeah. good news is I'm here with my band and people <laughs> to record music with. So, you know, that's, so I'm expecting the song tomorrow, tomorrow morning. I was thinking 3 PM my time this afternoon, but yeah. all right. <laughs> no, I, I definitely will make sure that it's priority in terms of getting it done in a timely manner. Cause I agree, you know, especially something that's derived. easier, so much easier. Yes. The results and it's better and you don't have these things, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, your exams It's if you leave them to this, you leave that term, term paper to the end, then yeah, then it's a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cause after this interview, we're going to be so, so up with, so have her energy and her voice in our heads and mm -hmm. It's just so much better just to, just to let it, let it flow then. Mm -hmm. and it, so it'll be some word will come through when you just some, some idea, some, I mean, the most important thing is this, this angle, you know, it's like, you know, it's like you having to think of a subject for your, your thesis now. And then, you know, it's the headline. It's that, it's that, what problem are I going to write about? What solution that no one, or what, what different way of thinking what different approach to a problem have I come up with? So with this interview, it's like, you know, these keyhole solutions was one example. What, so what's, what key insight can I tell people that they, you know, no one's really thought about before. And, and we're, luckily we're interviewing authors like, like, Hey, but we're, they've done all the thinking for us, you know, super smart people have written books and they had, they had covered in a book jacket with a beautiful summary on the back and a clever title it's all the work the homework's been done right so just just make it a rhyme <laughs> add, add one of your your amazing backing beats and... yeah that's that that sounds good and so in, in terms of you know because you said that you guys have a full production team over there you know we do a lot of production ourselves and i think that's going to be great to kind of meet somewhere in the middle yeah, um, yeah. you know i i think it could be a good idea you know I could be sending you demo, a demo, which could, you know, have any sort of backing track, or it could even literally be me on an acoustic guitar recording into my phone. Like, Hey, here's an idea for like a, a chorus. Like, you know, what, what do you think of this? And we can kind of really piece together, um, that sort of writing process. Cause in terms of the writing process, would you like, after this interview, have you had other like follow-up calls, like say with the artist and like written together on zoom or yeah, we just did one. Yeah. With another artist. Yeah. Okay, great. So I think that could be a fun thing to do too, is you and I can connect via email and figure out a time, maybe, you know, even sometime early next week, you know, for like 30 minutes or something, you know, just to get on and hold a couple guitars in our hands and just kind of see what comes of it. Um, yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this is, this is the free time, you know, once we go into all the production and studio work, then the the, the bill starts ticking, the, the, the meter starts ticking. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, let's, let's make the best song possible and spend all our time on it. So yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. That, that'd be great. And that's exactly how our workflow is too, you know, cause again, yeah, that, that ticket, that, that meter goes up pretty quick once you enter in the studio. So, you know, if you could have everything pretty much ready in terms of instrumentation, arrangement, lyric, melody, going into it, you know, you can really, it's, it's cost effective yeah. really. And these days at home, we have all the we have all the software that they have, the same software they have in the studio. They mm -hmm. just have, they just have better mics and, well, maybe better, better app processes and things like that. But uh, better plugins and sounds. But yeah, no, I'm super excited because, yeah, like going back to your songs, I was listening to, Overthinking. I really like that song and about your constant rumination. You, you could have also done a psychology episode. I've had quite a few of them. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. That's actually that's. It's funny you say overthinking because that's 
most people don't say that's the song that sticks out to them because you know it's not the ninth song on the album it's you know a more of an acoustic you know mellow song but there are people who have when they have said to me that they they resonate with that song they're like i really resonate with that song so that's that's special that that you feel the same i appreciate that for appreciate you for listening yeah and also please stop calling was uh mm. did really like especially the video as well and the that was a video with a zero dollar budget and a lot of that, that was a logistical, that was, that was a lot of work because we were doing that amidst, you know, school, you know, we were, we were, that was at, towards the end of the semester. So we had finals and papers and. Oh, yeah. as if life isn't hard enough. You. Yeah, I just, I just. So, but it's kind of great when you can do something like that under that pretext, because you, then you feel like you can do anything, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was. That was a fun song to make. What's your, I'm really what's, excited. What's your plan now then after university? What are you getting so, some of the music or? You... Yeah. So I kind of, you know, I, I, as I mentioned to you, you know, like what you're doing in this capacity, you know, fusing music and I guess, you know, like non-music or like, you know, podcast. Education. You know, yeah. yeah edu sure. You know, I think some sort of hybrid like that is something I'm looking for, you know, like whether that be, you know, working for like an NGO, like a climate NGO or you know, like an international body like UNICEF or something like that and doing, you know, like consulting or development planning or anything like that or anything related to the sustainable development, like that kind of whole world of you know, climate sustainability I'm interested in. But, you know, with music, that since I've graduated has been full-time. I've been doing music. So we are in the process of recording a second album and then we are planning on at the moment which we're in conversations with a few labels record labels to try and get more funding and to make this more sustainable and then eventually successful but we want to have pretty much like 12 to 14 songs pretty pretty produced out so that we can then you know bring it to the label that we've had been talking to as well as starting new conversations based on you know the networking that we've been doing and have, you know, it's nice to shop around the songs and see who wants to sign with them. And then from there, you know, with social media promotion, basically use all the songs and just promo them as like, Hey, these are a bunch of songs we've written, you know, and then see how people interact with the song. If we say, idea. say on TikTok, right. We post a promo, like some video, video, 10 different videos with 10 different audios and a couple of them have like a couple thousand views and one has like 300,000 views. Okay. That's the first single. You know, so, <laughs> so I think, you know, it's that, that's how we're kind of trying to do it because in terms of a label, a lot of things, the way that labels are operating now is that, you know, if like, they're not going to take a risk on an artist, like, and like, unless you're performing incredibly highly on social media, you know, it's not worth it to them. And so that's, I think predatory, I think, I think that's, you know, instigating not a great environment in a creative industry. It's very for-profit consumer facing, which has a lot of toll on artists. And I think COVID accelerated that process of, again, the commodification of the artists, right? I think, so we're, we're trying to maintain that sense of self in terms of, like, hey, at our core, we're artists, you know? And, mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, it's a, it's a big world and a lot of people are trying to do the same thing as us. So you, you gotta have that business mindset and promotion headspace with really anything. So if we feel like we have all these songs together and they're in a showable place, you know, we've been talking to a few labels like Capital and Warner and Electra, and they have interests. And so that's really exciting, but you know, it's just identifying how can we move the dial forward and as fast as possible. So. I mean, we're booking a lot of shows. You know, we just announced some shows that we're doing. We're doing one at Mercury Lounge in, in New York City. We're doing another show, a big hometown show in Boston. And so that's exciting. I think live shows is, are a big asset to us, you know, as a band. You know, we, we think, and especially when we talk to labels, you know, the thing that we always kind of say is our, as our brand is you know, oftentimes, I feel like nowadays you can't, like there aren't really any bands in the forefront that are 
under 25, you know, like the, the big bands um, that are still making music are great and they're successful, but like they're all, you know, they're, they're getting not old at all, but they're just getting older. And so I think there's, there's a void in space now for that next generation of band where, especially the type of band where you can name each member, you know, because I think there are some great, huge bands, but the band is what is kind of the selling point. But I think if you could have the band and the music be the selling point, but then as a brand, like the individual members are identifiable and there's like a identity and like a, a resonation with, you know, individual members. I think that's something that could be, could be, I mean, take like the Jonas Brothers, right? You know, like, mm-hmm. like each member had, you know, like their own fan base, right? Like, I, th- I think that's a, a great model for success because you have the band as the most important and the music is the most important. But if you want to go deeper, you can, because mm-hmm. each member has its own characteristics and traits and personality. And I think that's, that's something we've been exploring. But so a lot of things on the plate moving forward in terms of like music and career and, you know, making this successful and making this the ability. Like, I want to be able to make money and save money from the band. You know, I, I don't want to be mm. just getting by, you know, I, I want to be planning long-term and having the, my career in music finance that for the reason that I think that how hard that is, that's also why I, ha- I do have my degree in something unrelated that I still have interest and passion. And so that if for whatever reason, it can't become a career path with music, then I'll have that as a career path. Or ultimately, if they both can be a career path, how do I bring them together? Yeah. Well, this podcast will surely help get you some, you can, you can be the fans. You can get the thinking, the thinkers, the New York Times readers can yeah, read right. journal and then maybe someone else in the band can go, you know, lower, more. Yeah. Tabloids. Tabloids, yeah. yeah. But I, I hear what you're saying about the, the artist development because it's kind of, was it Catch-22 or, you know, the, the, the rab- labels are not interested in you until you prove that you already, you've, you, you've already got everything and you have a huge following. <laughs> and if you have all the huge following, you don't really need the label anyway. So but yeah, 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 that's, so that's something we've been wrestling with too. It's just like, well, if we have the following, that monetization is way higher in terms of what we're earning back in the end compared to, you know labels and I'm taking 80% of your streaming revenue. You know, yeah. They lent you all this money to do a promo, to record an album and then do the promotion. So you're in debt to them. And then you pay them back by doing the work that you were already doing anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is kind of maybe a little outdated in, in that respect. I think people feel like they can have autonomy now, which I love. I mean, hell yeah. Power to the people, but we'll see where it goes. It's going to be an interesting couple of years. Yeah, sure. It does help having a huge label behind you is just sort of, they have a ton of expertise and, but yeah, in terms of that, that 80, 20 split, that does seem a little bit generous in terms. Well, I mean, and taking the album that we just released too, right? I mean, we did that budget that we were able to finance, create for ourselves with the band's company. It sounds amazing. And, but that was like $4,500 with a major label that could be. To add a zero. 40, yeah, exactly. So, you know, and that could be the, the promotional camp, you know, package for the album, let alone, you know, but so it's almost hard to kind of grasp what the package and finances could be like and how that can help, you know, getting your music out to people. But because I think that's the biggest challenge is, is the promotion because there's so much good music everywhere. And oh, so 40,000 songs released every day or something like that. Yeah, it's something nuts. And it's like, yeah. for one, it's like, great. Hey, more music in the world is a good thing. Right. But at the same time, that saturation can make it hard for, to, 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 to break, to break it and to make, and to make it. Yeah. Yeah. So guys, I am so, so. Oh my God. I know. And you're a Brit too. And I'm like 20 proper 20 minutes late. I am so, so sorry. Please forgive me. I had car trouble and I just parked and then I ran up here. I'm so, so sorry. Oh, excuses, excuses. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for waiting. I feel terrible. You want to see something cool though? Yes. No way. I know. It gave me in the mail. I know. Wait, why, why is this blurred? Hold on. Oh, shit. 
Mm. There you go. Congratulations. Wow. wow. I know it's wild. Hot off the press. I know. And look at my little author photo in the back. That's so bad ass. Isn't it? The hell is it? I know. I know. I know. Well, I hope you guys can forgive me. I'm here for as long as you want me. I'm so sorry. Okay. Just, like, You're going to make you do terrible. homework. Yeah, I have to... I, you know, this is, this is what I do to the student, for sure. <laughs> You're getting your revenge. Now you've graduated, Scott. You could just, you know, you get your own oh, yeah. back on the left. Oh, yeah. like, like, I was recording this week, Scott. Good. Still up here right now. We're going to be here through Saturday morning. It's been just such a dream. I mean, like, that we have this house to ourselves. And we brought all our equipment up here. We flew out and our producer who's in Dallas right now. And we've just been working on a bunch of new music. Our manager came up from New York. So it's almost like a summit happening right now, which has been just so, I mean, I mean, I'm living out my dream, you know, recording music in a space where I can be doing it with no distractions. So that's amazing. You know, I didn't even know that Scott was a musician when he was in my class. Like I just had no... <laughs> And now I'm he's going to all out. It's yeah. like in the last couple of months, it's just been, you know, he's like, yeah, by the way. And then I was like, oh, you have like millions of people listen to you. <laughs> <It's pretty laughs> <wild. laughs> and, and now he's going to sing about you. I mean, how, how cool is that? Wild. It's really, it's really cool. I, I find this to be really cool. Yeah. We yeah. Sometimes teachers bring an apple or bake, or bake a cake, but this is taking it to a whole new level. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It really is. And I'm just like, I mean, I hope I see something, you know, lyrical. Like, <laughs> like well, wait, wait, wait. Well, no, it's, wait, it's wait. an instrumental track. Yeah. Exactly. That's, That's when you really know you fucked up, right? If they come <laughs> on <and> be at <laughs> 10 minute avant garde free <laughs> jazz, right? That's how you really know you fucked up. This is how you make me feel. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, no, this is going to be, this is, I'm so excited about this. You know, I, is my I'm, audio okay? Like, can you, is there like an echo? I'm in my office. No, you sound good. Yeah. Good, good. But I was, saying, I was so excited when I first heard about this opportunity, you know, when Jack first reached out, because I was like, what the hell? This is the perfect synthesis of my identity. You know, being able to have a creative influence from an academic conversation about something that's so important to me and to whoever I'll be interviewing. And I immediately was like, oh, I got to reach out to Heather. Like, oh my God, oh, she's perfect. Yeah, very sweet. Very sweet. No, I'm really excited for it. You know, this will be fun. It's very not academic y, right? It's very uh -huh. like, <laughs> it's very outside of the realm of things I normally do, which I love. Totally. And, uh, and I think we are overdue, by the way. I, I haven't forgotten about us needing to get together. I've just been yes. trapped yes. a bunch, but. Yes. Yes, we'll make it happen for Literally, sure. You've never actually met. Never met. So I was, thinking, I, I was just yeah. thinking, Scott, I was like, oh, have you ever been in this office? And it's like, no, you haven't. Which is so hard to believe. So wild. Because I feel like, well, which it is, like a, a fully fledged relationship, but I've like still haven't like given you a hug or something else. You know? Like, it's just, you know, it's, and she'll, she'll be, might be shorter like, than you imagine. Huh? <laughs> how, how tall do you imagine she is? That's always the thing when you meet her. Somebody. Oh, I think he knows I'm short. I have short person. You told me. Oh, I told you. Okay, but I also feel like I feel like I'm like one of those people. It's like I'm clearly short. Like I'm clearly short and think I'm really thing. large. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, do I have it? It's fine. I mean, you know, but I also project. Like I feel, yeah. But I feel tall. It's not. It's not useful. But I do feel tall. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm 156 centimeters, so I'm really, I'm really properly short. <laughs> I love that. Five foot one. So, so Jack, how, how do you want to structure this? Like, did you want to do some sort of introduction or do we just want to kind of get right into it or? Go for it. Cool. Yeah, well, try and try not to be too hard on it. You know, start with the easy ones and then go up to the. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, okay. I guess in that sense, you know, I know a lot about you, but for our listeners, Tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background, your, where you grew up, your academic background, what you've been up to recently. Yeah. So I am, I am an immigrant. Let's start there. My family moved to the United States when I was two years old. Our life in the U.S. started in Philly. Now my father is a professor and he was doing his PhD here. So education was the vehicle by which we moved. 
And, you know, it, we kept progressively moving south. So my family moved to uh, North Carolina because my father's advisor moved to North Carolina. And then we ended up in Alabama. And so I grew up as a brown girl in the south of the United States, which is as bad as you would imagine it to be. And, you know, I did K through 12 in Alabama. My school was actually, my, my city was a more diverse city as far as Alabama goes because it was a university town. My father taught at Auburn University, which was the local university there. And, but I always felt out of place, right? I felt an intense, an intense feeling of isolation. And it wasn't that I didn't have friends and it wasn't that, that I wasn't like intellectually challenged, but it was that, you know, it's that constant feeling of just not belonging in your surroundings, experiencing discrimination and racism, constantly feeling like it didn't matter how you performed, that people weren't going to recognize you, see you. And I thought, you know, that maybe if I went to Cairo, which is where my family is from, did my undergrad there, that somehow I would get like a sense of fulfillment, that it would be better than, than you know, life in the United States or certainly life in Alabama. And so despite my father's um, anger and annoyance that I would leave this opportunity of being in the United States, which him as an educator had created for me and go back to Cairo, I made that choice. And I went back, I was at the American University in Cairo and I did my undergrad there. And in that experience, while a bad decision was the smartest decision I'd ever made. You know, it wasn't the prestigious decision. It wasn't the status-based decision. It wasn't a decision that I would want a child of mine to make, but it was the right decision for me. And not because I felt a sense of belonging. I didn't. You know, I'm not an, you know, I'm an Egyptian, but I'm an Egyptian American. And I'll always be sort of this hybrid identity that doesn't really fit into one or the other squarely. But because it, it gave me, it sort of gave me other understandings of the social world that developed my interest to become a sociologist. So after I graduated my undergrad um, in political science, actually, I, I can't even remember if I minored in sociology. I probably did. I worked in poverty alleviation policy at a social research center in Cairo. And I was working there for two or three years when the revolution happened. And, and at the time I had already applied to master's programs in the United States because I wanted to come back to Cairo and be a project manager, work on a project that's on poverty alleviation policy. Like I wanted to be, you know, the, the principal investigator rather than the research assistant. But over the course of that year, you know, so the revolution happened. I was there in Tahrir Square. You know, February 11th remains the best day of my life, February 11th, 2011, which is the day that Mubarak stepped down despite what came next. But, you know, that time period was really a time in which I, you know, my identity as an immigrant was perhaps the most salient to me because I really didn't know where I wanted to be. Because on the one hand, I'd been accepted to Columbia University for this master's program, which is something I knew I wanted to do, you know, coming from a family with that, that centers education. And on the other hand, you know, I really wanted to be in Cairo, right? Like the country was going through this huge, you know, moment. And I, I wanted to more than anything to be a part of it. And so what I ended up doing is I thought I was going to go to the United States just for the year, just for my master's. But as I was in the United States, Egypt sort of devolved in various ways. You know, the Egyptian, we had a coup d'etat, right? Authoritarianism, you know, was retrenched. And and at the same time, I got into Princeton for my PhD. And so over the coming six years, you know, in the beginning, I thought I was going to continue to do research in Cairo, but due to the authoritarian retrenchment, I found myself unable to do that research. So I went to, to begin my research project, which was on poverty alleviation policy in Cairo, and I got kicked out. And so I came back into to the United States in the beginning of the fourth year of my PhD, which is really kind of, you know, pushing it in terms of years with no project. And at this, and it was 2015. And at the time, Syrians and others were moving, you know, from Syria through Turkey, you know, through the water in the Aegean to the islands of Samos and Lesbos and Chios, waiting for, you know, hoping for asylum in, in, in Europe. 
And, you know, the world watched as, you know, men, women, and children crammed onto these rafts, trying to find a solution to their, you know, to their displacement and to their, to the horror of war. And many people also ended up in the United States. So that's where the idea for Refuge, my first book, came. And, uh, and it was a comparison between what happens in the United States, Canada, and Germany. And the argument in that book is that, you know, we have this notion that these destination countries like Germany that's taken in about a million, uh, you know, refugees like the United States that led the world um, every year before the Trump administration on resettlement or like Canada that took in under Trudeau's administration, 25,000 Syrians, and then eventually uh, almost 50,000 that just arriving to those countries is enough, right? That these countries are necessarily saviors. And what I argue is that they're not. That, you know, it depends on whether you invest in people. It depends on whether you recognize people's humanity, whether you see people um, as full humans, which shapes sort of how they do. So uh, the subtitle of the book is How the State Shapes Human Potential. Mm. That's so interesting. And I think, you know, your ability to convey that in the book is going to be really exciting. Yeah, I'm actually excited to read it when it's, you know, maybe I'll just steal that copyright from me when I see you next, but you know, so, and so then I think backtracking a little bit in terms of, you know, for people who are going to be listening to this and who don't really understand or know too much about, you know, key push and pull factors for migration, maybe it'd be helpful for, for a bit to just describe what those different uh, push and pull factors may be for, for, for different situations and scenarios. Yeah, so so I'm going to answer this question in, in a different way than the way you asked it, so you'll have to forgive me. But, you know, the way to think about it or the way I think about it is that when we look at the world and we look at borders and we look at how those borders are drawn up, we have to recognize that these are inventions, right? These are imperialist and colonial inventions that have divided up the world in ways to maintain wealth in some places and deny it in others, right? Mm. So this is the result of centuries of exploitation, of denial, of the extraction of resources to the benefit of some at the expense of others. And the borders that we draw up and that we assign moral worth to are technologies for opportunity hoarding. They are ways to continue to maintain the wealth in some places and not in others. So when we think about migration patterns and we think about mobility, it's really people moving from places that have been denied the resources, that have um, seen an erasure and an erosion of the, of the wealth and well-being of people to the destinations, which are places that have done that injustice to them. So Tindai Achume, for instance, who's, who's a lawyer in, at UCLA, describes migration as decolonization, right, at the individual level, as a sort of reparation, where people are moving from place A to place B to be able to take part in the wealth which has been taken from them. And so, and so when we think about migration patterns, when we think about, you know, how people end up in a certain location versus another, we have to recognize that particularly in the case of forced migration, the vast majority of people never get very far. So when we look at the numbers, for instance, today, one in every 95 people is displaced, but the vast majority of those people are actually displaced within their country of origin. And about overall, about 83% are either in their country of origin or in a country that's very proximate um, to that country of origin. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's only 17% that ever get to the West, right? So if we think about this as, you know, frontiers between global South and global North, you know, we're thinking about who, who sort of makes it across in, in the imagination of, of policymakers or in the imagination of immigration detractors. You know, you have this notion, these ideas of hordes of people, right? Waves of people moving and migrating. And it's actually not that at all, right? First of all, this kind of imagery is really racist and dehumanizing. But second of all, the vast majority of responsibility for the injustice of, you know, denial and erasure of resources lies in the countries that have themselves been denied, right? The vast majority of Syrians are going to be in Jordan, Turkey, Lebanon. The vast majority of, of, you know, folks from of the Cameroon end up in Nigeria, right? So we have these, it's very proximate countries that are sort of holding 
the the bag when it comes to this when it comes to migration patterns particularly when the kind of migration that i study which is forced migration and so and 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 that's really a central thing to think about when we're talking about sort of global migration patterns right so when we talk about climate change or when we talk about war or when we talk about authoritarianism or when we talk about lgbtq oppression or when we talk about you know uh, denial of women's rights so when we talk about any of the or we talk about gang violence when we talk about any of these factors that may result in somebody being like fuck this i'm not living here anymore i need to move from my home and get somewhere else right i have to leave where I, what i know we have to root it in this global inequality in order to understand why somebody makes the choice to leave and often um unfortunately particularly in the case of, of forced migration where they go tends to be less important than where they began right but people do try to people to do try to hold out hope that where they go will see them as full human beings right and treat them with the dignity that that they deserve as such mm, yeah that's so powerful i told i think that really kind of encaptures the whole that almost answered the question that i asked and then what i should have continued the question to be. so yeah that <laughs> that 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 was really clear and yeah i think you know, understanding the point of origin, I think, is a big misstep where people don't look first. And I think that is definitely important moving forward in terms of having this conversation where it's a good place to begin. And so you mentioned, too, you know, these, these different factors, like you said, war, gang violence, oppression of women, oppression of LGBTQ rights, climate change specifically. You know, so mo moving more into that, that headspace. You told me that you were researching I previously the idea of like theorizing borders as a transaction. So how do you how do you think the climate crisis is going to interact with that idea? Yeah, so so to tell you a little bit more about that project. So this is the project that I'm going to be working on on for next year and that I've been working on in Greece. So this is the second this is my second book project. And it emerges from the first. So what happened was when I was doing interviews in Germany with the men, women, and children who boarded the rafts and ended up there to seek asylum, they spoke to me about the inordinate costs of their journeys, right? So, you know, you have to pay smugglers to get from place A to place B to get over the Syrian border into Turkey, to get from Turkey, from Izmir, across the, across the water up of the Aegean to places like Lesbos and Samos and Kios, um, to get from there into mainland Europe and then to move up to the destination countries. And so you're paying a variety of fees. You're paying visa fees. You're paying smugglers fees. You're paying for taxis. And I recognize that these fees differed by who you were. So if you were a young Black man racialized in a certain way or a young Arab man in the case of the Syrians racialized in a certain way, border guards are going to pick on you regardless of the kind of visa status or regardless of the kind of paperwork that you have. And therefore, you try to avoid the border as much as you possibly can. Versus if you're a family, right, you can't move in the same way that a young man can move, right? If you have children, if you're carrying things, and therefore you might have to commission taxis, you might have to move in different ways, right? You might not be able to uh, climb, for instance, a wall or jump over a border in Evros between, between Greece and Turkey. You might be forced to take the boat journey, even though it's a less, it's a more dangerous um way to move. And so taking into account these kinds of considerations, I began to think about the costs of migration, right? What are the thing, what are the expenditures that people make to move from place A to place B? And what are the expenditures that countries make to deny that mobility? And so this, this got me th thinking about theorizing the border as a transaction that's always costly and often deadly. And, you know, the, the, the thinking about this within this context of the question you just asked, which is about, you know, why do people migrate? How do we understand migration patterns? Is that the countries that are expending the money, right? So it's not just countries, but it's also the European Union. It's the United States, but through the third country agreement in Canada, it means it's Canada too, right? So these are countries, these are entities in the global north, right? Consortiums of countries who are denying people, mostly migrating from the, from the global south entry. But if we think about it from a climate perspective, right, these are the countries that are also causing the climate crisis, right? So the destination countries are the ones that are polluting, are the ones that are, you know, that are that are fueling the capitalist system that makes it so that we, you know, we're we're producing and we're we're having these emissions at rates that are sort of untenable, right? So where we're thinking about, you know, who is doing the damage, 
it's these destination countries, it's these wealthy Western countries, and at whose expense? It's at the expense of Black and brown people who are trying to to traverse that border, right? But at the same time, these wealthy countries are also spending hugely to keep folks out. And it's under this idea that with the climate crisis, and this is something I might have said to you um, on the phone, Scott, but with the climate crisis, there's this idea that, you know, there's these, again, the use of the word hordes, right? There's these hordes of people who are coming and the climate and that, you know, they're flooding and people are running from the flood, right? There's this imagery that surrounds this idea, which is racist, right? It's this idea that, oh, you know, we need to be afraid of climate refuge. This is another reason to clean up the climate, to clean up the way that we behave is because it's to prevent people from arriving. Well, based on what I've told you, the vast majority of people will not arrive here. The vast majority of people who are displaced due to the climate will remain in their countries or remain in proximate countries, which will, you know, result in the further impoverishing of those of those places. But what's more is that you know, we we really need to think about sort of what it means when you, the motivation to clean up the climate is to keep hordes of people out, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's 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 all this interplay of sort of who belongs, who doesn't belong, who should be allowed here, who is unacceptable here, who who cannot cross these lines, and and how much people are willing to spend rather than dealing with the source of the problem, which is you know cleaning up the climate, which is the inequality, which is the way in which these countries have been treated, which is the destabilization and military intervention in these countries, rather than focusing on those root issues, instead, states are paying exorbitant amounts to sort of deny people the right to move. Yeah, targeting the source and identifying what the source is, is I think a huge issue right now in terms of like, like you mentioned, you know, these big countries are spending so much money to try and keep people out of the country as as a result of climate displacement. But yet the issue itself is that the the countries that are contributing most, which is why the people are needing to move in the first place, are you know they're not they're not looking inward at themselves as like as a contributor to the climate change rather than mm-hmm. it's it's more of a reactionary base mm-hmm. rather than an anticipatory. Mm-hmm. That's case. And in that same front, I mean, one of the biggest culprits of this issue, the United States. I guess how how would like how does the pro in the u.s like what is the process currently for for refugees entering as a result of climate change like in in a legal way do they, do they have to is there a certain application or a certain label for that type of refugee when it comes to the united states or is it is that too far in the future and hasn't really been delineated yet so there's a couple of different things to think about when we think about the classification of people as climate refugees so it's never just about the climate, right? So, you know, what we can, we can classify Syrians, for instance, as climate refugees and people have, right? People have argued pretty convincingly that Haitians could be considered climate refugees. You know, we have, with the, with the climate crisis, you have increasing rates of droughts, right? People who are farmers can no longer rely on their farming. You know, you have the encroachment in Bangladesh, for instance, you have whole towns that are, that are being submerged underwater. You have places in in West Africa that are being completely desertified, right? Because of because of the climate crisis. But at the same time, you know, you're seeing increases in violence. You're seeing increases in, you know, in in war. You know, you're seeing wars happen. And these these factors, in the end, are related, right? Like you, they're not monocausal. So so you know, there's there's a correlation of factors, and you don't know sort of what's causing what. But definitely, the climate crisis is exacerbating these problems and exacerbating the crisis of displacement. But that said, under the refugee convention, right, climate crisis is not one of the one of the factors. Okay, so you are not recognized as a refugee, you're not recognized in this ILE, just, you know, because there's been a drought, because there's been a natural disaster. And so you really, it really needs to be persecution, needs to be race, needs to be war, it needs to be these kinds of factors. I mean, we could actually pull up the I don't know it off the top of my head, but we can actually pull up the 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 refugee convention definition of a refugee. Fled their country because of a well-founded fear of persecution on one of five grounds: race, religion, nationality, membership of a social of a particular social group, or political opinion. Wow, right? so climate's not even mentioned. That's climate is not mentioned. Yeah. Climate is not mentioned. What's more is that if you is that Haitians and and has recently written a really good piece for Al Jazeera on this, 
but Haitians have never been recognized, you know, because because borders are racialized. And so borders are, you know, are 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 racist tools, right? Excuse me. So Haitians have never been recognized um, as being eligible for asylum, despite having oppression in 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 direct, you know, having a fear, well-founded fear based on persecution, right? So even when people do qualify for asylum, under the definition, they're not being recognized. And so, and and this is a really important thing because, you know, race is a central aspect to this in terms of who gets recognized and who doesn't, whether it be about around the climate crisis, whether it be around, you know, regular asylum procedure, right? I mean, when you when you walk into a refugee camp in Greece, you see people from everywhere around the world, but you don't see white people. And mm. and that's a real telling thing, right? This is a really a story of, of you know, the fortification of borders against black and brown bodies. So we're identified states as a key actor in this too, but I think, you know, another actor that I think maybe needs to assert more responsibility is the role of like international governing organizations, especially in terms of climate displacement and its relation to, you know, the, the unequal representation and like who, who feels the worsening effects of that, like you're mentioning brown and black people. So what do you think the role of these different IGOs currently how that currently stands and where do you think it's potentially lacking? Yeah, I mean, I think that when we think about, so one one of my students, and this is less my, this is less my field, right? So I do states and I do individuals. But one of my students did do a study on, on what's happening in Bangladesh and whether when you think about things as the climate crisis, right? So when you, when you take the accountability away from the states and away from individual actors, you think about something as climate crisis is like, yeah, like, you know, man, like the ozone is like fucked up or something, right? And it becomes, it sort of displaces accountability. And so therefore, if you're an international NGO and you're seeing these Bangladeshi farmers like no longer being able to, you know, to make a living, you're like, well, what can I do about that, right? Like their land is going to get eroded and therefore I don't feel like there's an intervention for me. And because I'm accountable to donors and because I have to like keep, you know, use the money in effective ways, right? I can't throw the money away. And therefore right. there becomes this like general, and this is what, you know, there's, there's a lot of politicking around the concept of climate refuge and climate crisis, right? Both from the perspective of states using it as a scare tactic, right? That we need to clean up the climate in order, or, or people using it as a scare tactic in order to keep these people from coming here, right? But there's also this aspect of accountability, right? If it's happening in the climate, like who's really responsible for it? And unless we're dealing with the root causes, unless we're really trying to like cut our emissions, unless we're really, you know, intervening on the actual, you know, determinants of this, then we're being left in a situation where people are going to suffer. And, and we're really, you know, in the West, we're really not going to feel they're suffering that much. Right. And that, that part is overblown because most people are not going to be able to afford to come all the way here. Right. Because there's also an expense barrier issue getting back to the idea of the cost. And crossing oceans too. And I think, you know, uh, that's really interesting. I never thought about it that way, like assigning accountability in the global comments and like how one goes about doing that. And maybe that that is the issue in and of itself is that we're trying to do that. But then as a result, no accountability is assigned. Wow. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's pretty scary stuff to think about how like, you know, there really isn't a clear definition of you know, who can be accountable for certain things, especially because, you know, what we do, like you've already mentioned, like the example of Bangladesh, like the emissions that the global North is doing, whether that be the United States, North America in general, or, you know, like Western Europe, that is affecting regions that are on the other side of the world. But like that is hard to measure because again, it's all existing in this, in like the atmosphere, right? Like the global commons. So I think that's an issue that, is almost unresolved and kind of can't really be resolved at the moment without really, again, assigning the role of blame and targeting the root of the cause, like emissions, as an example, or like waste management or lack thereof. So when it comes then back to your personal experiences, so have, have you worked with or, or met people who've experienced forced migration through climate displacement? Yeah. So as I said before, you know, you can't have, there's no monocausal, right, story that we can tell here. But, you know, Syria experienced three severe droughts before the war. And definitely people who are farmers have told me about how the crop yield wasn't as good as it had been in previous years, right? So there was also the war. There was also the violence that resulted from the war. 
but we're it's also in the context of you know this this kind of erosion of resources and as we know when people are struggling for resources and struggling to feed themselves and their families right Con, you know that does foment disappointment and dissatisfaction and so these these cannot be separated right these ideas cannot be separated i mean you know we know for instance i i spoke to folks from the cameroon folks from nigeria who describe sort of similar phenomena so we we are dealing you cannot, I don't think, I don't think that you can say that anybody who is a forced migrant is not in part dealing with the climate crisis and that is not shaping their migration trajectory, right? I think everybody who is a forced migrant today is ha- is being shaped, their migration patterns, their decisions to leave home are to an extent being shaped by the climate crisis, but not exclusively the, the climate crisis. And I think, again, that we have to center accountability, right? Who is accountable? And I would, and I think that it's very clear who's accountable. It's wealthy countries who are the reason why these people live in countries, who, who are the reason why, you know, countries in the global South have been eroded to this extent, or the reason why the climate crisis is happening. They are accountable for, for creating this situation which people cannot stay in their homes. Assigning that in- intrinsic link is really important. I think that's, a, that's I think, where this needs to move into is like understanding that like no matter what the push and pull factor is related to discrimination on race gender sexual identity violence and climate crisis that not to say that it's because of climate crisis but that assigning climate crisis as again this it's it's linked and it's all interconnected i think is a is a very visible way to view the issue because again it's not it's not a singular minded approach you know like there there is so much interdependence when it when you move from topic to topic and where people are moving based on no matter where the region and so 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 where do where do you see this issue going in terms of well you kind of already nailed it on the head in terms of you un, needing to understand that it's not the climate crisis that is forcing migration the climate crisis is is a part of the issue but it's more so the matter of this idea of discrimination based on race gender and the other you know characteristics that we were talking about earlier, but, you know, I was talking about Jack before you came on that there's been in the system that we talked about in class was this rise of nationalism um, and then mm-hmm. nativism. And so how do you think that that rise in nationalism, like geopolit- geopolitically and like sociologically is going to be impacting, you know, the legality be- tr- behind trying to help people that are in migration, you know, make it an easier, like less barriers to entry or like, you know, we're talking about in terms of accountability, in terms of having people understand like the, on the individual level that this is not just an issue of climate change. It's an issue of people who are experiencing climate change are also experiencing these other issues. So do you think, how do you think nationalism kind of plays a role in this and where do you see that going? Oh, Jack, I'm reading, I'm currently listening to a podcast on the Trojan horse affair. So I'm like particularly like into also British. I'm I'm thinking a lot about British nationalism today, <laughs> actually. But but I think nationalism is a super central part here because when we think about what borders are, right? So if we agree that borders are social constructions, we believe that borders are these technologies to define territories as we are here, we belong here, you are there, you do not belong here right? The bases for borders and the bases for how we draw those boundaries are definitely notions of belonging and notions of exclusion, right? And when we think about sort of who we are as a nation, who are we as Americans? Who are we as British? Who are we as French? Who are we as any of these countries in the West, right? You'll find that in the response, right, are notions that even if people aren't saying we're white, right, or we're Christian directly, which they often actually do say those things, But even if they don't say those things, you'll find that implicit to the response, right, was often a notion that we have a national culture, we have a national identity that people who are coming from outside either need to assimilate to or they risk threatening. But really, you know, I found during the Trump administration, I found that the rhetoric was really upsetting to me, not just the rhetoric from the Trump administration, but also the rhetoric from detractors, from people who are who are challenging the Trump administration, because it made it seem like, you know, this moment of the Trump administration or even the moment of Brexit 
was like a unique moment in history, right? That suddenly, you know, people became nationalists. Suddenly people became racist. Suddenly people became white supremacist. I'm like, you know, I hate to break it to you, but our policies and our laws in these countries have always been predicated on whiteness, right? Have always been predicated on the exclusion of people in co of color, have always been violent against brown and black bodies. And so when we think about it from that perspective, right, these are, um, you know, borders can become more rigid or more permeable. You know, they're not, they're not constant over time, but they're always based on notions of who doesn't belong, who doesn't get to partake in sort of our national wealth and and who um, isn't a part of the us that that is deserving, right? That is worthy of of recognition of being full humans in this space. So, what do you, so in terms of for, for our listeners, you know, what do you think listeners can be doing? How does this issue look on the individual level? I think listeners can be doing a lot. So at the micro level, I think challenging your perceptions, right? So something, for instance, that I have done personally is in the book in Refuge, which is called Refuge and not Refugee for this reason. I don't use refugee as a noun unless I'm identifying a legal position, right? Somebody is classified as a legal refugee. And the reason I do that is because when you think even, even the, something as simple as the use of the term refugee can be dehumanizing, right? No, it's a person. It's a human being, just like me and you, who is seeking refuge due to the fact that they've had war that's displaced them. And turning it from a noun to a verb, right, seeking refuge, allows for the person to be the agentic human who is acting, right? And so when we think about as, you know, as we think about who we are as people, how we think about, you know, how we relate to other people, I think centering the human you know, and there's this rhetoric around anti-racism, there's rhetoric around feminism, there's, but, but it's really just centers, comes down to, you need to think about other people as humans just like you. And when they behave in ways that you wouldn't behave, I want you to ask yourself, like, why is that the case? And try to learn more about their context and their structure, because guaranteed that's where the answer is, right? And not in the sense that they have different values or they're different kinds of wired people than you. And if you reorient yourself in that way, which, you know, is a way to sort of, uh, is, is central to how we, how we can relate to other people from other races, from other backgrounds, right? When you reorient yourself in that way, you necessarily humanize other people. And this dehumanization of black and brown people, right, is centered around sort of understanding them as having different values, as having different understandings of life, as being less than, as being not as intelligent, which is all, of course, untrue. So that's at the micro level what people can do. Just like think about your priors, right? Challenge your priors. You know, at the meso level, right? Organize, right? Like organize, you know, organize around climate issues if that's what you're interested in. Organize around immigration if that's what you're interested in. Organize against policing and against incarceration, which are all related issues, right? It's all about the policing and denial of, of the mobility and of the, of the possibilities. Of black and brown folk, right? So organize around those issues. It doesn't have to be about around immigration because these are all interconnected issues, which is why we see immigrants in the same kinds of camps and the same kinds of prisons that we do other black and brown people who are citizens, right? And at the macro level, right? Like we have to lobby our, you know, vote and lobby, you know, you have to, you have to participate in your political systems, you know, and, and, and also revolution, right? <laughs> Some of these some of these changes aren't going to come from within the system, right? And we have to recognize like when we have to take through the streets and when we have to be part of something bigger. And so those are the, that's, that's what I'd say to, to listeners about how they can be involved. And so, and then that's, I totally agree with all that. And I think, you know, each level is important and they're different, but they're all, again, connected. So I guess a, one more question would be, in that same vein, like, do you recommend any content for listeners if they want to continue their understanding of this in terms of like docu docu series, documentary, literature? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's so much stuff. I mean, there's so much stuff. And I'm kind of um, on the spot, but yeah, no, there's there's a lot of stuff. I mean, I would say, like, I mean, there, I mean, I, you know, part of me wants to say, yeah, read Baldwin, right? <laughs> read like. You know, read, read, uh, you know, read black, uh, black and brown authors about what it is like to be black and brown, right? I, like at the very beginning, but also, you know, 
there's tons of really good stuff on borders that's recently coming out, right? Like Harsha Walia has a really good book that just came out, right? I just read a really good book on territories. He's the author of whom I'm I'm blanking on. Adam Goodman has a good book. I'm looking at my bookshelf here. Adam Goodman has a great book on called The Deportation Machine about how like, you know, the American system is constantly deporting people. Man Guy has really, really good work on, you know, the way in which citizenship and inclusion in the United States has always been predicated on what there's a British author whose last name I think is an Nini who writes about borders and and colonial legacies in the UK. I mean, there's just tons, there's tons of work of fiction and nonfiction that centers these questions. But I would really, you know, reading from authors who are reading from non-white authors about these, you know, you know, like Mbebe and like and like Baldwin and like all these people, right, who write about sort of the dehumanization, but also the humanity of people of color, I think is the place to start because I really do fundamentally believe that these issues of migration, these issues of accountability, these issues of border control, the violence that we enact on other people, central to them is the fact that we don't see them as human, that 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 there's a lack of recognition of people's humanity. And and I think reading around the topic, reading, reading the writing of people who are centering that humanity is the first step towards imagining a different world. I think that is probably the biggest takeaway is is just that sentence right there from from this conversation is understanding that people are people and that even though and and not dehumanizing that idea of migration and of refuge and how refugee can even sometimes have link to racism like that word can be racist and i think you know it's important for the listeners to understand that the climate crisis and the climate displacement is affecting people at a disproportionate level and oftentimes that is based on race ethnicity religion and sexual orientation and gender and i think that oftentimes gets overlooked and i think because a lot of times this issue can just kind of be grouped as like oh it's climate crisis but it's so much deeper than that and i think i'm like incredibly honored to have you know have you sit down and like really like spell that out so clearly and like offer such good analysis on that because i think again there just only needs to be more of that and so yeah, that's that's pretty much all, all the questions I have. But how about freaking awesome? Like, thank you so much. It's so totally my so pleasure. Powerful. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry again for being late. I'm never late. I'm sorry. <laughs> like completely lost track of it. I'm so sorry. Are you working on another, another book as well? Did I hear? Yeah. So that's the second one is the cost of borders one, and so I'll be in Princeton working on that next year. Okay. I got the real takeaway for me as well was that the problems don't start borders are the problem, but also once you're through the border there's still many problems yeah because it's all sort of from the same origin right so like if you're if you're saying that these people don't belong here that you know that they're not acceptable right when they come here you're also your your welfare systems your support structures are also not not being structured to sort of champion and support them and so it's 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 all related right which is why when it's like what do you read i'm like you know you 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 read enough to learn that Humans are human. Mm, mm. Yeah, powerful. I have a uh, Rami Sam coming on the show in a couple of weeks. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, so I'll that's... be getting. Wow. I'll be getting a, a real insight into the uh, Tahir Square events. So you were there too, yeah? I was. Yeah, yeah, I was. Wow, I don't think I knew that that you were on the ground when that unfolded. That's that's remarkable. Like. Yeah, February 11th. I mean, yeah, I mean, I was there that and, you know, and the day that he stepped down just remains, it was just, I can remember like every minute of it, it was just completely seared in my memory. I mean, part of it was that we thought we were going to die because we were marching to the presidential palace and they were supposed to open fire and I promised my father I wouldn't do it. And when we got there, it's like you, I saw the presidential palace, I'd walked from Tahrir to the presidential palace, which is kind of near right where, where my family home is. And they didn't shoot. Not only did they not shoot, they he's they reported he'd stepped down. And then the world just erupted. I mean, people had fireworks. Mm. You know, women and the cops were belly dancing. It was just like a wild, it's a completely surreal experience for me. And I was just like sitting on a curb sobbing because I was wow. just like such a release. I couldn't like, I couldn't process. But yeah, it was, you know, and we just had another, we just had the 11th anniversary of it a couple, couple days ago feeling the weight of generations just un 
unleashed. I mean, that's just, yeah. I, I, I must yeah, I mean, probably... but then, it, you know, but then it got more authoritarian and all my friends right. went to prison. So, you know, <laughs> you win some, you lose them. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, well, yeah, that's, I guess. That's another episode. Yeah, that's the yeah. next episode. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I was about to say. <laughs> Yeah, like, you know, so many issues. It's incredible. It's just uh, so much material. So. Yeah. Yeah. But this is really cool. So tell me about your process. I mean, do you guys have to jump off? No, no. Yeah. Okay. Tell me, so tell me about your process. What happens next? Well, Scott writes an amazing song. <laughs> <laughs> what, so, I, hope I, so, I hope I was lyrical, Scott. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there's like any sound bites. Sound bites you have, you have, when you, when you deliver, it's almost like a sermon in some in some examples, you know. Like there's a certain like, there's a certain rhythm to to how you speak to how you. Speak. Well, you, you take like Martin Luther King or someone like that, you know, it's got a great speech like that. You just put a, you know, I have a dream. That's you put a bad thing <laughs> on that. That could yeah, that could, that, that could be a good sample. No, but I think no, seriously though, I think um, your like your ability to convey and I mean you're a lecturer, you know, like I mean you, you're a professor, like you should make speeches. That would really. It, 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 seriously it's though, like discipline. To inspire, you know, and so I think, yes, plenty of content to sit down and write with for sure. But <laughs> so basically, back, like, I'd give you another A if you were back. Then. <laughs> I think you already got an A. But. <laughs> yeah, I think I did. Yeah, that was. Uh, th yeah, thanks for that. No, but uh, I think the basically how the process works is Jack and I are going to kind of go back and forth on notes in the next probably week or two, and then. From this conversation and the notes we have and how it inspired, you know, just like this kind of, now we move into the creative headspace and we think like, how can we synthesize what we've been talking about in a way that can A, resonate with the most amount of people possible, but B, work in a way that is now like we're in an artistry field mm -hmm. and, and doing it in a way that isn't sappy or corny or like, you know, like kind of avoiding like buzzwords that may kind of like create like an artificial like distance or barrier for the listener you know because like politically driven songs can be incredibly powerful or it can yeah. be a little bit like stiff and just kind of yeah. you know like so i think that's probably the biggest challenge is, is is doing that in an effective way where you where you can kind of cut through the bullshit you know and really like get to the root of what we were talking about in in an artistic way and then basically once we do that it's yeah, and then three about, but then from there, uh, Jack has a team out in Italy and we, he will essentially, you know, produce the song out. So we'll record a full arrangement, you know, with all the instrumentation from vocals, guitar, drums, keyboards, synthesizers. It's so wild, guys. Yeah. And then. <laughs> I'm like so excited to be part of this. Thank you for picking me. That's, full that's really great. Yeah. So full production, mastering, and then. In terms of release, does it go on, uh, does it go up on Spotify, the song, or yeah. how does that? Yeah, so yeah. then you'll be able to listen to it, have a really whenever, show your your, your class, whenever, whoever. So you know. exciting. Yeah. So exciting. And are you based in Italy, Jack? I am, yes. I know. Uh, actually, one funny story with to finish is I was, I was searching on Spotify to see if you'd done any other podcasts so I could just, you know, listen to you. And I found your personal profile and all your playlists. <laughs> I'm, uh, I only, I only listen, I listen exclusively to really shitty pop music because I listen to it when I Yes, I've got some <laughs> film comics here. This is the sound we have to go for. Oh, uh, that's so good. A, that's such a, a, like a fucking, that's such an invasion of my privacy, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> and not only that, but there's a, there's a marathon, a 10K, half marathon, 10K cycling. I'm a so runner. I, I do. I do a lot of. I do a lot of. I do a lot of uh, movement. Yeah, I'm I feel, I feel it. like a stalker. I must admit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're exposed. Yeah. Like, you know. Yeah. So my so so what's funny is that so my husband's a musician and and he's oh. a pretty good one and he and he's like big into like rock and like you know he does like I don't know it, it, and I have like really shitty taste in music so he is. So we're just like complete opposites. So he'll make me a playlist and I'll be like, no, not like, not like poppy enough. He's like, I don't even know what the fuck that means. <laughs> so I, but I am notoriously, I am notoriously shitty. Like, well, not shitty, but just like not specific and certainly not like cool taste in music. I wasn't impressed. Um, no. 
but I know like, he, he isn't either, and it's fine. <laughs> well, I'm so excited though for him for him to hear the song. That's going to be great. What a full song! I, I hope he yeah. likes it. She doesn't like it. Then, this be... then we know it's good, right? <laughs> I guess you know it's good. That's you know it's good. <laughs> oh, that's great. I'm sure we'll both love it. <laughs> yeah, so we'll be sure to keep you updated um, as things move. You know, we'll send you uh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll send you a, a sneak peek when we get something showable. And you know, who knows? Uh, now is this is this conversation also going up somewhere or no? Oh yes. Oh okay. Yeah. Okay. The podcast. Yeah. Okay, so this is the podcast, and then it goes up, and that goes up on your Spotify, Jack. It'd also be on Spotify and all all uh, podcast channels. Yeah. And also YouTube. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's cool. Some good content for the resume builder. Not that anybody here really needs it. Well, I guess I can do, but you definitely don't. So. <laughs> no, that'll be fun. Are you, and then, but you'll take out, you'll, you'll edit it, right? It won't be the part where I like broke to tell you about the Trojan horse. <laughs> so I, like to, I like to keep everything in because it gives it to, it's a. No, yeah. all, but have you, you heard know. this podcast, the Trojan horse affair? No, I haven't. Oh, you have to listen to it immediately. It's okay. so bonkers i know it's the trojan horse affair it's so bonkers it's this guy anyway listen to it tell me what you think what's it about like a quick synopsis yeah so it's about this the trojan horse affair which is apparently this letter written in birmingham about like this guy saying that this guy was islamizing schools and he loses his job and like the they change completely the school administration etc and there's never an investigation on it until there's this one like reporter years later who's like, who wrote this letter? What happened? Why did this guy lose his job? And and so this is, it's like an investigative podcast about this specific case. And it deals with all the topics that we talked about today because it's, you know, it, you know this from the first couple of minutes, but 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 the the letter was a complete hoax and the guy loses his job and nobody's willing to investigate because it benefits everybody to just have this guy sort of sidelined. But it's very well done. It's it's like serial podcast or whatever with the New York Times. So it's very well done. Okay, I'll check it out. Wow. So yeah, I think I'm going to check that out too. That. Another song in that. It's just everything is so many, so much material. The album is well along, well along the way. <laughs> yeah. I can't wait. I can't wait. This is so exciting. And where are you now, Scott? So I'm up in Maine in a gunkwit mage. It's like an hour or 20. I love a gunkwit. That's a cute, it's a cute little spot. Beautiful. So yeah, we're kind of tucked away in the woods about like maybe three minute drive from that main beach and that kind of downtown strip. Yeah. Good so food uh, I was impressed with the food there. Really good food. Can't go wrong. They got like pretty eclectic taste of food. There too. They like, do. It's like, pretty impressive. Yeah. So yeah, that that's uh, the way we're, we're up here right now. And I, I don't know if you can hear it, but I can hear it. Some... I can hear them. I can hear yes. them. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that wasn't too disruptive. Oh, I could just hear them now, actually, as you're speaking, but I couldn't hear them earlier. Yeah. So it's great. I get to have an awesome conversation to start my day and I walk out and just get to make music for the rest of it. So well, awesome. yeah, hopefully this could be life every day, right? <laughs> yes. 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 Well, thank you guys so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. No worries. It's our pleasure. Thanks so much. So thank good you. to catch up. We will see yeah. each other soon. Yeah, I'll be in touch. Soon. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that was great. Wow. Wow, you did an amazing job. That's, uh... Oh, I hope. I, I was worried about timing. I, I couldn't really keep track of when she first came on. I hope, I hope it was long enough. No, it was great. Yeah, really. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, isn't she just a freaking spark? Oh, my God. <laughs> She's a firecracker. <laughs> yeah, she is. Uh, it was so interesting about, yeah, that. that's because you, you're looking for the line, you know, seeking refugee instead of refu refugees. That that was really like you. You highlighted that as well, and I think that's really the key takeaway for me is humanizing them, not dehumanizing them. Right, and also like you know, and I was really happy that she focused a lot and kind of kept tying it back to this, but just like like the 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 way that race and gender and sexual identity, you know, play a huge role in this too. And I think that's often overlooked. There's a lot of like grouping that happens with this, but. She just kept going back to that idea of like, hey, it is necessary to view this as like, yes, climate displacement is a problem, but that it's even more of a problem for people that are non-white. And I think, you know, that's something that I, th I think is going to be actually like really, really interesting to write about, you know, like that idea that this issue is 
multifaceted and affects when it affects you, it affects you in a negative way. But then again, like it, th there is this disproportionate layer that I think does get overlooked because like she said, like you just look at refugees as well there, that's the group, the refugees, but what about black refugees or Hispanic refugees or, you know, like, like Syrian refugee or whoever, you know, and I think, and the different ways that legal processes and social interaction interacts with those different groups of people and how that is in like there's inequality in that and no, and no white refugees like right yeah yeah you know unless i don't know if australia floods or something like that or some right or england goes under the waves then mm -hmm. then people might or like yeah might become we... <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah i think jack seriously I, I, this was so great I, I think we got a lot of good content i loved this this was so fun i hope you felt the same this was really really good uh, this is my everyday so <laughs> yeah right right <laughs> what am i saying yeah <laughs> yeah that's so good so i guess next step let's maybe try and find a time i'll check the calendar and maybe sometime in there tomorrow i'll shoot you okay. an email with maybe yeah. any time uh monday tuesday wednesday of next week is pretty open for me okay let's uh, do it. So we can, even if it's just 30 minutes and just kind of be like, let's get a, like a Google doc or a Google drive folder and just kind of con combine notes before we kind of get into the writing. But do something now, start now. Yeah. Just have a quiet moment before you go to the guys and just, this is to get the, the spark still there. Some of the energy speaking through. Definitely. Definitely. I'll make sure I do that. All right, buddy. Jack, thanks so much. It was great catching up and great talking to you. I'm excited to uh, get this process going for real. All right, let's do it. Cool, man. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Sacrifice.